Philly Streets Talk. Philly Streets Talk. T, what up? Philly Streets Talk. Rich, what, what up? up? Mo, what's what up? up? My name is Jay Douglas, also known as Maj, for Philly Streets Talk News. This is an exclusive interview that we have with a 17 and a half year police veteran, Andre Boyer. Now, through our conversation, our several conversations, he has indicated that there's been some corruption and he wanted to play his part and do the right thing and make sure that certain aspects and elements are brought to light and the general public is aware of what's going on behind the scenes and the inner working of the Philadelphia police. Stay tuned. We have more for you. Philly Streets Talk. Thank you for staying with us. Next to me, I have Andre Boyer. Andre, welcome to Philly Streets Talk. How you doing? Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for the exclusive chance to get your message out there. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself as a, as a police officer, as a former police officer. Well, as a former police officer, I was very good at what I did. Uh, I made, I was the highest arresting officer in the 22nd District 5 squad. Um, I made anywhere from 25 to 35 arrests a month. Basically, what we, what we did as five squad, we were the captain's assigned uh, unit that went around the district and hit the uh, areas that were on the uh, PSA sheet as for robberies, um, where narcotics were being high at, and uh, shootings, especially when uh, attacks on Temple students. So we concentrated in those areas. So you guys were pretty much in a very dangerous area. Yes. Okay, okay. And um, it, for the people that don't know what goes on behind the scenes, tell us about a typical day when you were going to work and what that process was. Wow, a typical day in the 22nd district. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. Anything, it could be quiet for the first hour and then after the first hour, bam, you're running from shooting to shooting to robbery, robbery, um, police officer assist. Uh, the 22nd district was one of those districts that just never died down. Um, as you know, it's a very dangerous district because two of my uh, fellow officers uh, had fallen and they got shot and killed within the 22nd district. And like I said, it's a very dangerous district but the people in that community are, are awesome, they're good people, but it's just a handful of people that want to tear down the community and don't want to do the right thing. And those are the people that I believe my job was to go out and arrest. And not just arrest, but you know, sometimes police officers, especially in the 22nd district, we also did community service. Like, we care about the people in our district. Gotcha. Know? Now, that 22nd district is predominantly North Philadelphia? Yes, it is. Okay, and specifically what areas in North Philadelphia? Uh, like 17th and Montgomery to 33rd and Diamond. Gotcha, gotcha. And I, me being from the area, that's a pretty tough area over there. Yeah, we got the projects, which is, is, is overwhelming with a lot of stuff going on in there. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, when arrests are made, uh, how often do you get the people that try to get away or do you get uh, situations where you have to draw your firearm? Um, for myself, um, I very rarely had to draw my firearm. Um, Ever a discharge? Yes, I've had several discharges and um, several shootings within the 22nd District. Um, also, cat, also came into uh, some site robberies where a guy pulls out a gun and I was at a 2-9 in Cumberland and the guy decided he wanted to rob a Chinese store with a mother and daughter and two men in the in the, in the Chinese store wow. and yeah and it became a gun battle between me and him and uh, I shot him and he got arrested. He, well, well you went home at the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> right, right, right. Good thing. Good thing. Okay, so I guess th I'm sure there's a lot of gray areas okay in, in policing and how things are done um, has anything come to your attention that uh, you feel may not have been the right action to take against uh, a civilian on the street who may have broken the law well I can only speak for me I can't speak for other officers um, I only treat people 
as if the way I want to be treated in the street. Sure. You know, I wouldn't treat them no different than I would treat a family member. Even once the cuffs are on you, you know, I still want to treat you with respect regardless of how you treat me. Sure. And sure. that's just the way I am. Sure. Sure. We'll come back to more on the police and, uh, you know, some of the typical uh, situations that you guys go through. I wanted to get into more of the guts of why you're here. Um, you consider yourself to be a whistleblower, is that correct? That is very correct. That is, you're absolutely correct. Yes. Right. And that's gotten you a lot of flack in recent times, yes? People have uh, felt some type of way about you uh, kind of blowing the whistle about certain things. It's not only gotten me flack, but it, it's gone as far as um, putting my family's life in jeopardy and mine. Um, it's it's overwhelming what I had to do and still what I'm doing to get the truth out there because there's a lot of moving parts to it where it was reported and after it was reported people didn't want to own up to the fact that they did wrong by not reporting it so now rather than to do the right thing they buried it and made it, made it even worse. So what you're talking about specifically uh, is some sort of cover up Corruption, scandal, sort of thing, all those things worked into one, is that correct? Corruption, officers stealing overtime from the city in order to an effective arrest. Yeah, it's. It, it, it. And what makes it so bad is I truly believe that supervisors high up within the Philadelphia Police Department and Internal Affairs were aware of this. Wow. So if they're aware, then I'm sure the higher ups are also in the loop as well, is that? Is that right to say anything? Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, this is nothing new to the people at home. I'm sure they've been paying attention to the news and uh, you know whatever various media sources that they're getting their information from. But police all over have been uh, suffering from a few rotten apples that are kind of giving. And 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 and, and the to home in on that, it's sad because in Philadelphia, I love the cops that are in Philadelphia. The 85% of the cops that put on that shield and go out there every morning and leave their families and do the job, they really, really are dedicated and want to do the job. Sure. But you have a handful that are corrupt, dirty, and bad. And it's just not the police officers, but what makes it hard for the police officers, you have an administration of bosses who are corrupt that do blackmail, that have been caught having sex brothels, have been caught stealing and not punished, and have been, yeah, a wide range, caught DUI, had officers change the DUI. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that the bosses, it's okay for them to do and get away with, but when it comes to the police officers, you can't. Perfect case and example. Sure. Um, Eric Horn, Inspector Aaron Horn, and Captain John McCluskey. They were the two high-ranking bosses that actually destroyed evidence after getting a phone call from a retired captain. His grandson got locked up in the 35th. His grandson got tased. He was fighting with police. And they, that very night, destroyed all evidence of his arrest. Wow. For the captain, for the retired captain. Now it gets better than that. After they destroyed all the evidence, you would figure, okay, this would go away. No. The young man that they helped, Ronnie Handy, destroy all the evidence for him. Okay. He, in turn, became a Philadelphia he became a cadet for the Philadelphia Police Department two months after that incident. Now that is amazing, and I'm sure that kind of uh, helped him along, didn't it? Oh, uh, but it gets, it gets better. He then sued the Philadelphia Police Department for beating him up and tasing him. He won because Captain McCluskey and Inspector Aaron Horn destroyed all evidence of his arrest, and he won approximately, um, I say, about 80 to 85 grand from the city of Philadelphia. Wow, that's a nice little bump. Uh, and, and right after that, like I said, he was um, a candidate within the Philadelphia Police Department Academy. Amazing. Uh, and just so the people at home are aware, uh, this is a totally separate incident. 
Yes, uh, this is just a part of corruption. how the corruption goes. Now, what Ramsey did, Ramsey stopped the investigation from Internal Affairs. Internal Affairs is supposed to do a total packet on the whole job. And then when they get done with the packet, they're supposed to send it to the DA's office. And the DA's office will sign a declination saying whether they're going to file charges or whether they're not. Ramsey did something, and none of the media said anything about it. Which he said, because these two cops have done so much good in the community, I'm only going to give them 30 days suspension. I'm not going to fire them. If it had been a police officer, they would have been fired on the spot. Gotcha. I'll tell you what. Uh, we will be back in a second with more from Andre Boyd, the whistleblower. Philly Streets Talk. You're still with us. Thank you. This is a Philly Streets Talk exclusive with 17 and a half year police veteran, Andre Boyd. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. All right, again, the last time we left them, uh, we were talking about Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey, okay, which is a perfect segue into what brought you here today. Tell the people, why are you here? Basically, I'm here because I became a whistleblower. Um, basically, what a whistleblower is, I saw and I observed corruption within the Philadelphia Police Department. And as a law enforcement officer, I was bound to, bound and by my duties to tell the truth, what I saw. Um, this happened in 9-1 of 2011. Um, me and Officer Angel Ortiz who was my partner, badge number 9556. We were on routine patrol in the 22nd District. Um, we were on the 1400 block of West Diamond Street when I observed a gray Cadillac and the uh, back brake lights weren't working. So I turned my lights and sirens on and we pulled the vehicle over. Before I got out of the vehicle, my partner, Angel Ortiz, said, um, can I approach, can I talk to the guy? I said, okay, no problem. Now, this I was a routine stop. Yeah, it was a routine stop. So right. I said, okay, yeah, you can talk to the guy. You know, I don't mind. Um, we exited the vehicle. We approached. Um, there was a black male in the uh, driver's seat. He was the only one in the vehicle. How old was he right um, now? I'd say he was about in his, uh, I'd say his early 40s. Okay. And um, basically, we asked him to exit the vehicle and walk to the rear of the vehicle and talk to us. And he did. And I said, while you're doing that, gather all your information, your license, and registration. And now, uh, is, it, is it typical to have uh, someone that you pulled over step out of the vehicle from the beginning? What I've been doing is I've been doing something different that uh, Philadelphia police officers um, haven't done. And what it is is a special training that I had, and it's called drug interdiction. And in drug interdiction, we always ask the person out of the vehicle. And that's for officer safety purposes. True. Um, that way I can see their body, no bulges or anything like that. True. And I also can read their body language, you know. And if they're nervous or if they're shaking, I can't see all that in, while they're in the car. And if there's any weapons in that car, they're out the vehicle. Of so it's safe all the way around. That makes sense. Now you've at this point asked the young man to exit the vehicle. Yes, I asked him to exit the vehicle. He did. So out the back of the vehicle, um, he handed um, me his driver's license and vehicle registration. So then I went back to the police car while Officer Angel Ortiz continued talking to him and asking him different questions. Okay. Now, I did observe while he was at the rear of the car, while I was inside the police car, running his information, that the male was fidgety, nervous, moving around a lot, and that's a little unusual because most people, you know, a normal person wouldn't do that much fidgeting and moving around. Well, he was. Let's give the people the benefit of the doubt and say that because of what's been going on with police in recent times, that that might be normal action. It may be for some logical for some, for some and that's to get why, nervous. And that's why you talk to them and you get them real calm. It, it, you make them feel less like, intimidated. Yeah, less intimidated. You, t you talk about how's your family, how's your mom, how's your your kids, what school do your kids go to, you know how fast does this car go, and what by doing that you're you're letting the person feel comfortable. And where they shouldn't, if you're you're talking to them and they're cool, they Should all their nervous nervous. Is, yeah, all their nervousness would go away. Sure, sure. You know, okay. Um, and I was observing different things about the male while he was being tall. He he got cotton mouth, um, started sweating on the forehead, and it wasn't really that hot out to be sweating. So I'm observing all these different things from him. Um, from my training, 
that usually tells me that there's something that ain't right. You know, he's overly nervous. Sure. He's not acting like a normal person would during a court stop. And, and you do have people who do, you know, have had bad run-ins with police and they do get nervous. Sure. So that's why you continue talking to them to calm them down so you, you know, get a good vibe. It's kind of like a, I call it my own lie detector machine. You just, <laughs> you know, get you get a you get a baseline and you get them calm and then you go from there. Sure. Um, while I was doing all this, I finished running my information on him and everything came back good. Um, so he was good to go at that point. All his information was. Sure. Um, once we got to back, I walked back up to the vehicle where he was and Officer Angel Ortiz. Um, I then had a conversation with him and handed him his driver's license and uh, his information. And I asked him, I said, uh, jokingly, you don't have no guns, knives, or bazookas in the vehicle. And he came back and said, um, no, I don't have no weapons in the car. And then I said, you don't have any narcotics in the vehicle, do you? He got he, his eyes, he took his eyes off of me and looked downward. So, talked about some other stuff. And then I said, yo, you sure you ain't got no guns in the car? And he says, no, I ain't got no guns in the car. You know, no person was straight up, come say, no, I don't have any guns. Sure. And then I said, um, you got any narcotics in the vehicle? And he's quiet again. So that tells me something is not right. Sure. So then I asked him, which he, I asked him, I said, um, here's a form. This form is a consent to give me permission to search your vehicle. You don't have any guns, you said, and you say you don't have any drugs in the vehicle, correct? No, officer, I don't. So I handed him the form. I said, can you read and write? Because I like to ask people, can you read and write? Because I don't want to give them a form, and they just say, well, I just signed it because he just told me to. Sure, sure. You know, I want the people, when I read it to them, I let them know what, you know, they can stop this search at any time, um, any time they want to stop, you know. I mean, I just want to be clear. Yeah. You had... A, a consent to search form on your person, ready yes. to go. Yeah. So you got yeah, of course, because you're out there. That's your that's your purpose yeah. out there, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you gave him the form you were reading. It to I you. handed him the form. Uh, he said he could read. Um, he started to sign his name, and that's when my partner Angel Ortiz said, "Yo, work." Yeah. He don't have to sign that. I said, "Excuse me." Yeah, he does have to sign it. He says, "No, he don't have to sign it." I said, "Why not?" He gave me verbal consent. I said, "No, he really needs to sign this." He says, no. And then, the, then Mr. Um, Singleton says, do I really have to sign this officer? I said, no, you don't. Because legally, he doesn't. You don't, right. He, he doesn't. Right. So I took the paper, and then Officer Angel Ortiz says, uh, he gave me verbal consent to search the vehicle. And did, did that happen? Did you, did you witness or hear that? I didn't, I didn't witness him giving him verbal, but I, at the same time standing there, I didn't hear Mr. Singleton say, no, he couldn't search my vehicle after Angel said he gave me verbal consent. So he, but he, so he did not object to that. He didn't object to it. So yes. I'm assuming he gave it's it to okay. him. Okay, right. Yeah. So after that, me and him walked over to the the, the trunk, the hood of my car, and leaned against my car while Officer Ortiz walked around the vehicle. Then he went to the passenger side rear door of the Cadillac, opened it up, reached in pulled out this bag and then looked in the bag and then said cuff him, cuff him. So, you know, I cuffed him for officer safety, put him in the car. Sure. I walked back to where um to the vehicle and, and Officer Ortiz put the uh, bag on the trunk. Now at this point, was he officially under arrest or he was just being detained while well, you guys figure out what's going on? He was being detained until I could until we could figure out what was going on. Sure. Um once we got, once I walked up to the car, Officer Angel took the bag and put it on the trunk of the car, and he opened it up. Inside the bag was clothes, and then there was another bag, and then it was a black plastic bag. And inside that black plastic bag, Officer Angel pulled out a white bag that contained heroin. Well, we knew that was coming. And, it had to be something, right? And I said, "Wow, good job. How did you see it?" And he said, "Well, I could tell by the way it was packaged." Now, I've been an officer for many years, and I can tell you that's a bunch of BS. You have to have x-ray vision to see through a bag, clothes, then another bag, then a black plastic bag, and then the bag that actually holds the heroin. Yeah, that's almost impossible. Unless but, it's me. But my partner, he's the one who has to stand that up in court because he's the one that recovered it, sure. not me. Sure. So, I said, okay, 
We're going to take this. We take the car to the 22nd district, and we'll take the prisoner to the 22nd district, and we'll take the drugs. That's what we did. We got to the district. Um, I brought Mr. Singleton in the district in handcuffs, sat him on the bench, and outside the, uh, the cell room. Then Officer Angel Ortiz came in, sat down beside him, and I stood on the other side of Officer Angel or Officer Ortiz. Officer Ortiz then put the bag of heroin in front of him. He put the heroin in front of him, and right in front of him, sitting right across from Mr. Singleton. Then he's showing everybody, hey, look at this wonderful bus. We got a big time bus. You know, see this? This is a real bus. And actually it is a big thing because sure. for a police officer in patrol to get that amount of drugs on a car stop is big. Usually that's the kind of drugs that you get when a fuel unit hits a house or sure. raids a place. Sure. That's the kind of drugs, not off a car stop. Which he was probably en route to one of those places. Yes. Right, right? Because he did admit to um, Officer Ortiz, later I found out, he did admit to him that he was on probation for um, delivery. He may have been heroin. No, no. But, uh, well, that was, he said it. He said, I was on, he said I was on probation. He said I'm on probation for um, transporting heroin. Gotcha. And, um, so while we're in the hallway, Angel's showing everybody the drugs, Officer Mike Vargas, he comes up and he's, he's trained in drug and addiction. He has well over 3,000 hours in drug and addiction. And um, actually that's how I got started. I got started with him showing me and training me. And then I went to classes um, in Fort Indiana Gap Town where the National Guard actually trained you for how to do drug and addiction. So and they, what then did Mike Vargas do? He asked, he said, Warrior and um, Ortiz, can I go search the vehicle? You know, with this amount of drugs, there's probably a gun or a hidden compartment somewhere in there. And he said, yeah, go ahead. I said that it was okay. Angel said it was okay. So Mike, while the vehicle's parked on the uh, 22nd District, Officer Vargas, Michael Vargas, he then, what he does, and I find that I think that all Philadelphia police officers should have been doing. Matter of fact, if we had been doing what Mike or Officer Vargas was doing, a lot of shootings and a lot of things wouldn't come up in court as being wrong. Sure. He basically videotaped and took pictures of him doing the, the search of the vehicle. He took certain pictures of the vehicle outside. He took uh, pictures of the in interior of the vehicle as he conducted his search. Sure. So when he did, or if he finds something, you can see where it is and it hasn't been tampered with before it's yeah. being removed. Yeah, and these photos would go to court as evidence. Where did you see it? Where did you first see it? This is where I first saw it. This is where I recovered it from. Which is good police work. Mike Vargas wanted to jump in on some of that action. That's what happened. Well, 9 out of 10, he, he, he's really good at what he does. Matter of fact, he's an instructor, sure. and um, for uh, he's the only instructor in the city of Philadelphia that um, has a license to do drug interdiction. Wow. And uh, so he's very good at what he does. So he thought there might be a hidden compartment. So he, to, he went around the whole vehicle. He didn't find anything, so he came back in the district after taking photos of the car. He also took photos of the heroin on the table. And... Then he said, you know, then he left. So then I said, all right, Angel, we're going to take this down to Central Booking and we'll be done with this. He was on the phone. He was talking to an officer, Cuffy, uh, badge number 9924. And she's with the Narcotics Field Unit. Okay. They handle big That's quantities the thing, right. of drugs. That's their thing right. every day. Right. They handle big quantities of drugs. Right. So I said, okay, great job. They're going to, they're going to count it. They're going to weigh it. They're going to do the whole nine, and they're going to do the PARS report. All we got, all my partner has to do is give a summary, synopsis of how he got probable cause and recovered the drugs. And that should be the end of the story, right? And that's the end of the story. Sure. So I thought. Right. Um, we get down there. He drives. He takes possession of the, because he's the one to recover it. He takes possession of the heroin. He has it on his person. He drives the vehicle, Mr. Singleton's vehicle. Because when you, in Philadelphia, if you get caught transporting drugs, your vehicle is automatically seized. Sure. So his vehicle came with us. Okay. While we were down there, you know, we made it to, I followed him in the police, in the police car. We went to um, the armory, 
At that time, that's where Narcotics um, Field Unit was. We went inside the building. I came in first and Angel Ortiz came in behind me. I walked inside the operations room. Officer Angel Ortiz was stopped by Officer Kofi right at the door. He had the drugs in his possession. She was talking to him, pointing at the drugs, and then they walked down the hall. So I figured he's talking about the job and you know what happened and how he got the probable cause. So I sat down to catch up my log, the police log, and the other police paperwork. Okay. They came back about an hour, something like that, uh, later. Um, I didn't think anything of it because, you know, if he's telling a story, he's probably telling it from beginning to end just like anybody else would. He sits down at the computer, he types something, so I figure he's typing it, you know, his story, what, it, what happened, so she could tape it, you know, so she could put it to the um, search warrant or whatever she's going to do. Sure. Um, now, let, let's not search, I mean, not search warrant, but so she could put it to the PARS report. Let's, let's fast forward a bit to the first situation that uh, you felt was not right. Okay. Um, I say maybe four or five weeks later after this arrest, um, I get, I'm in the hall of the uh, courthouse at CJC. And uh, the ADA walks up to me and she says, um, can I talk to you for a minute? I say, sure. And she basically says to me, um, do you remember that big drug arrest you and Officer Ortiz had? I said, uh, what are you talking about? Are you talking about um, James Singleton? Yes, that one. Right. I said, okay, correct. She started getting into some stuff and I was like, what are you talking about? She says, well, what time did you call for the dog? I said, what dog? Um, what time did you get the search warrant? What search warrant? Sure. What are you talking about? Sure. I said, um, we never had a need to get a search warrant and we never had a need to get a dog because Officer Ortiz recovered the drugs at the 1400 block of West Diamond Street from the vehicle, from the car stop. She looks at me and she says, hmm, oh my God. And I'm like, what do you mean, oh my God? She says, well, he said, that he recovered the drug. He said that, um, no, Officer Kofi stated that she recovered the drugs. I said, no, she didn't recover the drugs. Officer Angel Ortiz recovered the drugs. I went back later on that night and looked up the PARS report. No, wait, man, before we move on to that report, when she told you that, how did that make you feel inside, or what thoughts were Well, to when she first initially told me that, I said, hold up, wait a minute. Let me tell you what really happened. I told her, I said, we stopped the car, Angel saw the drugs, he recovered the drugs out of the vehicle, we went to the narcotics field unit, and that was the end of the story. Sure. Where are you getting dog? We never called for a canine. That never happened. So automatically, there was never a need to get a search warrant. I told her that, and I said, "Do not put me on the stand because if you put me on the stand, I'm going to tell the truth." So from the door, you were ready. To I said, say, "This oh, is wrong." Right. Yeah. I said, yeah. "What happened here? If those officers told you that, you need to tell your boss." Philly streets talk. She responded, like I said, she said, "Oh my God," mm. grabbing her chin, and then she said, "Well." I guess I'm gonna have to uh, dismiss that proved or disproved that either Angel took any money from him nor I. Now that was their conclusion. However, the city then turned around and banged me with departmental policies and gave me four sets of 18s under the departmental policy and gave Officer Angel Ortiz a written warning. Now you said four sets of 18s? 18s is like uh, basically for the public is, is punishment. Like you did something wrong and this is what we're punishing you for. What type of punishment is it? Just out of curiosity. Um, basically, um, it, it, it's, uh, well, you, what do you want the exact terminology for what it was? Uh, yeah, what happens when you get 18? Like, well, you when you get to 18, it depends. You either get um, you either get a 30 day or five day or 10 day suspension or you get terminated. Wow. It just so happens that these allegations that they put against me, each one is a terminating offense. And my partner, he only got a written warning. Now, the case, when we went to arbitration, like I said, 
once again, the arbitrator took my, my partner's word versus mine. And he stated in his arbitration, he, the arbitrator said that um, there was no evidence given that Officer Angel Ortiz would have a reason to lie or defame um, Officer Boyer. So therefore, I'm going to believe Officer Angel Ortiz. So essentially what it sounds like they, they've done is they cooked up a reason to let you go. Basically. Basically, yes, because I told the truth and I wasn't letting it go and people would have been held accountable if someone had listened to me. ADA would have been in trouble and those two officers would have been fired. Now, it gets even crazier than that. After I get fired, I then go back and I talk to the DA's office. He basically, um, Chief Mark Costanza basically blows me off. Tells me you can go do whatever you want to do. We, we run this office. You don't. We're not going to do anything. Um, I went back to the FBI. Um, I went, matter of fact, I went to the FBI. They had me on record as being down there 13 times. They did nothing. I had one phone call from a federal agent and basically he started talking to me. We got disconnected and I never heard from him again. Do you recall any of their names? No, he didn't give his name. He just said my name. Um, he just said I'm uh, so so blah blah blah, and then my phone went dead, so I didn't get his name. Sure. And I was thinking, okay, well, you know what? He's gonna call back. He didn't. That was it. That was it. So then I started going to the FBI, saying, "Can you tell me who's the investigator?" No, we can't tell you that. Can you tell me if you're investigating it? No, we can't tell you that. So basically, screw you. Yeah. Basically, I went back to the police administrator, talked to Kevin Anderson. Same thing. Nothing got done. So. I was about ready to just say, okay, you guys won, you know, but I remember something that my uh, dad used to tell me, he said, son, if you did something wrong, then, you know, you take your lumps, you lay down in your thorns and roses. And he said, if you didn't, you latch down like a pet bull and you fight. You fight until the truth comes out, regardless of whether you win or lose. So that's what I did. I continued my fight. And... That's when I went to the Philadelphia, I went to eight Philadelphia Inquirer news reporters and two daily news reporters. I gave them all the evidence and everything. Not one of them wanted to touch it. Not one of them. And what do you think? I, to be honest with you, yes. I believe that Charles Ramsey has Channel 6 and the Philadelphia Inquirer um, in his pocket, so to speak. And what I mean by that is... Basically, they have some kind of agreement where I'll give you an exclusive of this cop over here being locked up if you don't run that story. Or if you don't run that story, I'll give you this. Wow. I, mean, I can imagine that happens, but when you have a situation where the right thing needs to come out, you would suspect that you know one of those media outlets might want to take that on and say, look, I'm going to expose this, but no one wanted to do that, huh? Nope. So... I said, how do I get this investigation reopened? So then I went back to internal affairs and I made myself the complainant. And I went down and had my interview in 2015 with a Sergeant um, Matthew uh, James. And I told him the whole story. I said, you know what, um, Officer Ortiz, um, we recovered the drugs at the scene. I told him that, you know, there's never a reason to get a search warrant. Um, Officer Kofi saw the drugs when Officer Angel had them in his, in his possession before they went outside. You know, I told him the whole story. I said, you need to investigate and interview all the five squad people. You need to interview Officer Mike Vargas. He's the one that took the photos. I gave him all, I told him to pull the court, court transcripts. You know, you can see the difference in the story. Pull the pars, you can see this. Now, I had my attorney present. Which is um, My attorney is um, Stephen O'Hallen. Shout out, Stephen. Yes. Um, great attorney. He, he, was, he was there with me. And something that was unusual was um, Sergeant James was not the only in, um, interview in the uh, room. It was uh, a lieutenant and another sergeant also asking me questions. And um, I, was, I found that strange that, you know, I'm being interviewed by three internal affairs investigators 
on on this case. But I said, well, maybe you're now going to dig into it because you know I have nothing to hide. I've told you the truth. Maybe now they are. Were you able to get all your information out at that point and hit every mark, or could, did they kind of? Uh, I gave you down? no. I gave them all the information. Um, basically, they crossed me as trying to find out or trip me up to see if I was lying. That's what I caught from them. They they didn't really seem to me like they really cared. It was like more or less, all right, we're gonna just handle your complaint and that's it. What was the conclusion from that? Uh, there is, they still have to give me a conclusion. Um, basically, what happened was, um, after not hearing anything, I went to Internal Affairs and I asked Sergeant James, I said, well, how's the case going? I can't tell you. I said, well, can you tell me how long it would take? He says, I can't tell you that. I said, could it possibly take a year? He said, yeah, it could possibly take a year. Uh, that's and, amazing. And so, I then just took it a chance. Just took a chance. I saw a news article and in the city paper. And this guy's name was Daniel Denver. And he worked in the city paper. So I took a chance, I called him up, and I told him who I was, and I told him my story, and I would like to meet with you and give him my information. He says, well, I, I'm busy, but I got, I'll, I'll take some time for you. And these guys gave you a shot, right? Uh, the city paper, yes. I, uh, the city paper, they're true investigators. They fight for justice, and they'll get the truth. I went to his office. He sat down, he talked to me, and he says, well, I'm not just gonna take your word, you know. You got something stronger than this? And I gave him the information, and when he started reading the information, he said, I was going to, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth, I was going to pass this on to somebody else. He says, but you know what, I'm going to start on this today. Nice. And he did. He was true to his word. It took him about a month and a month and something to do a thorough investigation, which, you know what, I give him kudos for that. He did all his... He crossed all his, um, all his T's and dotted all his I's. He did a thorough investigation, and asked questions about me, and I said I would even be willing to take a polygraph to prove to you that everything that I'm saying is true, and I would pay for it. And I wonder why that was never suggested before, the polygraph. That's, uh, that's normally a good indicator. Because if you're telling the truth, how you think that's going to look now, you've got something, a, a statement that proves that I'm telling the truth. This is true. So, you know, they wouldn't want that. This is true. Before we move on, let's take a quick break. Stay with us. Philly Streets Talk exclusive. Philly Streets Talk. T, what up? Philly Streets Talk. Rich, what, what up? up? Mo, what's what up? up? As we bring this exclusive interview, Andre Boyer. Shit. Boyer, right? Mm -hmm. okay, all right. As we bring this segment to a close, I'd like to thank you, Andre. But before we close this thing completely out, please tell people uh, the police officers that are actually good cops and have witnessed corruption and cover-ups, please give them some advice. For those officers that out there that I know within the Philadelphia Police Department have witnessed and know of corruption, like I said before on the radio station, I'm fighting, I'm fighting this fight against corruption for you, not just for myself. So if I can stand up and do it alone, you can stand up and do it alone too. Don't sit back and let this corruption continue. It's like cancer. It's up to you to cut the cancer out. If you love your job and you love the Philadelphia Police Department, then help me and help yourself take this corruption down. I know, just like everybody else knows, that there's bosses that will come after you. But you know what? You have a family. You have a duty. That badge, it says honor, integrity. How can you give honor and integrity if you allow the corruption to continue when you know about it? You don't have to do it per se yourself, but you can put it in a packet and send it to the U.S. Attorney General's office or the DOJ, but do something. Don't sit back and let this continue. Hold somebody accountable, because you know what? They definitely will hold you accountable. Philly Streets Talk. Philly Streets Talk. T, what up? Philly Streets Talk. Rich, what, what up? up? Mo, what's, what's up? up?